Hey, Ian. Hey, Ian. Hey, Ian. Yeah. Would you say that that review is a real cat fight? and salutations board game fans the dice pirates are back this is episode 47 and we're going to go ahead and bring you a review of isle of cats it's it's late you know in uh, in true fashion for us we're a bit behind the times but really been enjoying that game lately so we're going to talk through that figure uh let you know exactly what we think about that and how much we've enjoyed it i of course as always am your captain ian joined by matt and aaron how you guys doing oh hi 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 Ian, Ian, guess what? What? I'd be fee lying if I said I wasn't excited to talk about all the cats. Oh! And that has been this week's episode of oh, the God. Dice Pirates. That Hope was. Everybody has a good week. I'd be fee lying. Did you get that? I was. That's that was physically painful, um, which means it was a perfect pun on your end. I, I loved that. I thought I thought about that in the five seconds between you saying, let's get started the recording and you calling my name. That's, that's oh my how quickly gosh. that's how quickly this dome, uh, the, the dome works. The old the old magic brain. That noggin is really putting all the pieces together, isn't uh, yeah. it? Yeah. I'm done. It. I'm done for the night. You're done for the night? Well, you can't be totally done because I know that you do have a soapbox that you want to give us. Yes, I do. Okay. I had a great experience playing a game the other day and it got me thinking about just... Sometimes the little details that designers can put in games that are like the little, like, mwah, chef's kiss, you know, the salt bay sprinkle on top. And uh, in, in, in the game Godfather, the board game, from Simon and designer Eric Lane, the secret sauce, the magic, is the little metal suitcase that you put your money in. All right, so quick quick explanation of uh quick rules explanation not rules explanation that's too detailed quick explanation of godfather the board game it's basically you're vying for control of new york city playing rival mafia houses loosely adapts the feel but not in any way the plot of the godfather movies uh but the uh one of the core mechanics that's really fun is that you have a little metal tin that you use to stash cash when you complete jobs or, or missions or shake down a business or whatever when you make money in the game you can not at will but at certain moments when you trigger an action that allows it you can stash cash into your little suitcase and the thematicness of it is that at some point when it all hits the fan everyone's got to flee and leave the country and you want as much cash as possible in your suitcase when you do and whoever has the most cash wins uh, there's lots of other things that make that game great if you wanted a full breakdown. I'm actually pretty sure we've talked about it at various points on the show. It's a neat mix of area control and like wildly violent backstabbing that occurs as people blow off card bombs and drive by shoot each other. It's, it's, it's really great. It's an underrated game that didn't get its due, which we've talked about before. But the awesomeness of the little suitcase really struck me a few weeks ago when we played it because uh, it came down to uh, the end of the game, and it was time to add up the score. We had four folks playing on a game night, and if we, I think we looked around and realized nobody knows who's in the lead. Like, not even remotely. Like, there's a lot of games that kind of obscure who's going to win because there's so much in-game scoring and bonuses that can come into play. So there, you know, there are moments when you're surprised by the winner, but there's rarely a game where everyone is just like... I think I know how much money I have in here, but I have absolutely no clue because at some point you're just chunking money. You're just stashing money, and you lose. And, and for me, who doesn't have a head for numbers anyway, had no clue. Gun to my head, couldn't even told you within $5 how much money I had stashed in there. Uh, and so we start counting out, counting out, and lo and behold, I won the game, and I was as surprised as anyone. And it was an incredibly hilarious moment. And I realized I don't think I've ever had that in a game where I was 100% flabbergasted that I won and thrilled that I did, and the entire uh, last act of the game was all the more surprising because of it. So uh, that's that, that's basically the soapbox. Just one really fun design choice uh, made that game all the better, in my opinion. I just want to add a little little stinger to this. First off, um, it, it's out of print. If you can find a copy, though, like if you play games with people who don't like take that mechanics yeah i don't know why but for a game that has so much take that happening constantly 
it never feels bad like it does in other games. That's a good point. Like it, I, I, I don't, I don't know what the secret sauce is there, but I taught the game the year that it came out and had the chance to hang out with Eric Lang for a few minutes as he taught me the game and, and told me about it and stuff. And the official story is, because I was, he was showing me the game, and I was immediately, like you, I was immediately smitten by the little metal suitcases. I was like, wow, this is the best thing in a game. And then he proceeded to tell me that that was like the second or third thing that he came up with when he was designing the game. And that initially, Simon told him he couldn't do it because they were expensive and they took up a lot of space inside the the box of the board game. sure, yeah. (laughs) And they were like, can we do like, you know, a player screen or like a a folder or something, you know, like a a paper suitcase that you fold in half? And he was insistent. He was like, no, it has to be these little suitcases because, you know, he, he understands that like, the physicality of something can yes. absolutely elevate the experience. And he was like, no, it, it has to be the little mouse suitcases. Uh, and, you know, Simon was like, well, you're Eric Lang, so I guess we have to go with the suitcases. I love that so much. I love that he was, like, willing to die on the hill. Did and it. you know what? He was right. He was. He was. He was absolutely right. You could certainly have done this with a lot of different other solutions. The basic idea is they're just trying to say, like, you stash the money in a way that's out of sight of other of other players. But a player screen, you would still know how much money you have. So that eliminates one of the joys, which is that you forget. You can make a little folder or something, and maybe it's, like, out of sight. But come on, like, sliding fake money into a little folder? I mean, come on. Uh, you maybe could have made them out of paper craft, like cardboard, but they would have been dinky. They would have broken up. Yeah. The fact that they're metal... They look like little suitcases. I mean, there's, yeah. there's nothing else to it. They look like little suitcases. They look incredible. And they're much bigger than you think. They, you could probably put a deck of cards in there. Or maybe two. Like, they're pretty big. It's perfect. I love the design of it. I love that. Uh, I love that that was something that they ever were concerned about. It's like, oh no, this is too big. Because, you know, as I'm sure ah! we all remember... <laughs> The two, two foot, foot tall, tall Galactus 17 inch mini wide. <laughs> for we'll uh, for Zombicide, you know, and uh, just uh, you know, also, also. Um, but that's uh, essential you know, for C-Mon. the game, Ian. And that's <laughs> essential. You need a two foot zombie uh, Galactus. It just oh, it man. just blow it just blows me away that it went. Simon was like, "Are we sure that we want to spend that These much metals, on an okay. ancillary part to a game?" You know what? I bet like, how I far bet they've if come. He, I bet if I bet if they had asked, like, "Can we make these out of plastic?" I bet that would have immediate full send. Yeah, you know what Maybe. probably happened is that we Sculpted. we have the suitcases to thank for <laughs> the massive Galactus. That's actually there's, you can draw a direct line. I'm sure. You, are, you, are you saying that Godfather the board game uh, walked so that? Uh, Zombie side could run. Is that yeah, basically, uh, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. I will say, uh, last, last, one last thought on the uh, Godfather stuff, and then we'll get off of it. But I just, uh, I just really like the fact that, like, it's great. It's a great little tactile thing. But there aren't a lot of games that actually like remove the score from your mind so completely. And maybe that's one of the reasons why even though it's a take that game, it doesn't feel as stressful because you don't actually know whether or not you're winning or losing. You don't know how far behind you are. Uh, you might even be winning. So it's hard to get... It doesn't feel as like frustrating to have your quadrant of the city car bombed and all your people die because you're just like, well, I could be like losing by a mile anyway, so who cares? So in a weird way, because the overall score... It's completely obscured both how much money you have and how much money everyone else has. You're just playing the game, and that's kind of cool. That's actually something that not a lot of board games do. I don't know if there's any other board game where you're that completely opaque about like the winning, the the in game state. Yeah, no, it's it, it really does make the game a lot better, and yeah, I really I really enjoyed. It. I would love to get the chance to play it again. We'll have to pull that out the next time I'm down. 
To move on to something a bit different and definitely a little more sad, I just want to kind of go ahead and talk about the uh, the recent loss that we had. Uh, obviously, you know, Klaus Teuber, the designer for Catan and uh, head of Catan Studios, truly an, you know, an incredible figure, especially within board gaming, did pass away uh, last week, April 4th, mm-hmm. and uh, is when they is when they put, put that out. And uh, the, uh, he was 70 years old, and they did go ahead and put out a statement regarding this. But I just kind of wanted to, to talk about, you know, obviously, you know, condolences to his family and, and the people who knew him and everyone surrounding that. And, you know, we'll never, cannot, you know, do not, do not feel that pain. And obviously there is... A, many layers of separation there but it was a game that did affect you know my life growing up it was one of the first board games that i really played and got into and i'm sure for you guys as well and regardless of how much you've played it it absolutely shaped the face of modern board gaming as a whole it's something we did talk about in one of our previous episodes so i kind of just want to go through and talk with you guys just you know about your memories of Catan, sort of its place in gaming and sort of just kind of a memorandum on that real quick, just remembering Klaus. Um, just wanted to, Aaron, how about you? Um, so I, I, I've, the first time I ever played Settlers of Catan was maybe five or 10 years before I really got into board games. Uh, I played it with a girlfriend at the time and her parents and her dad was very serious about the game and uh, did not walk away from that experience having had a fun time. <laughs> that having been said, while I don't personally really, really love Settlers of Catan, I would be a fool to ignore the fact that, I mean, it, it without Settlers of Catan, I don't know that the board game renaissance that we're, that we're in happened. Like yeah. the fact that somebody saw this game at a toy fair and then brought it, you know, bought bought distribution rights because the the game design scene in Germany was was you know already starting to happen, but this was this was like this is the reason that we have games that are called Euro games was German game designers and this one game that was brought in that just exploded i mean you know like like ian said there's the Catan company there's a whole company built around yeah later spinoffs but really it was just the success of this game setting up and establishing in in the 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 common consciousness of board games can be actually good and fun and enjoyable and can be kind of fiddly with rules sometimes, but and can be complicated, but that just adds to the good time that you have. Like you, you absolutely, you, you you can't deny that all of that happened in that. You know, it's it's really it all yeah. goes back to Catan. I think there's a real chance that there, if there was no Catan, we're not here right now talking about board games on a podcast in the year of our Lord 2023. Like we're just. I don't know that board games begin that turn toward a really larger audience and uh, in the creative in the creativity you're seeing in the space where people are making all these innovative and, and creative and interesting ideas. Like, I don't think that happens if, if old Klaus doesn't sit down and say, what if I made a uh, what, if, what if I made a very cool board game so it's in a fictional land? called Catan. You know, I don't, it is a fascinating game. It's, uh, it has everything about it aged as well. I mean, no, I mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's not, I don't think it holds up to, you know, some things, but it's also undeniably fun. Like really, like, I don't think, I don't know. I mean, you're, and you're getting hosed by the dice and nobody's trading with you and you just can't get that wheat you need. Like it's frustrating or whatever, but like, it's a good game. It's a smart design. And it was the bridge thing that took us past, for a lot of people, it was the bridge that took you past like family board games, traditional classics into like, oh gosh, there's a whole deep world out here. Like board games are like, I've been in the shallow end the whole time. So it was really like the raft that took people out to sea in a lot of cases. My exposure to Catan, I played it late. I avoided it. I don't know why. Not intentionally, but I didn't have a friend group that played it when it was like getting super trendy. And then... uh 
once I fell into hobby board gaming, it was way into the like deep end of like much heavier games. So the first time I ever played Catan was with you, Ian. You brought it over to my house. Wow. And we played it. We played it one night, and that was the first time I played it. And uh, I immediately enjoyed it. I still enjoy it, and would be up for a game of it almost any time. A dice-driven game that can kind of like lock you out entirely because your luck is just not with you. That's uh, that's always a bummer, you know. And so, so many modern games have like tried to mitigate that. And I'm sure there are Catan like pros out there, like, people that are really good at it, that would tell me that's not possible. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you make smart choices. But there are times when you're playing it where the dice diciness of it does feel like it's it's holding you back, and, and there are elements of the game that are just not totally in your control. So it doesn't feel like a true Euro in my mind in that sense. But it kind of it made Euro games sort of accessible to a mass audience. Yeah, I mean, it did it in many ways paved the way for those sort of games we look at now. And it makes a lot of sense that it found the success that it did. I mean, when you look at the the numbers of units sold, I mean it. It was popular in a way that we haven't seen any game really reach since then. I mean, you look at the the amount of money, uh, amount of numbers it sold, and it really does sit up there with a game like Candyland, Life, Risk. You know, like the the popularity of it. I mean, almost everybody has a copy of Catan and Monopoly in their closet. You know, the fact that right. it sits in that in that sphere is, is quite impressive. And I think a big part of that was that it made people realize that you could make games that keep people engaged the whole time. Like, you know, like it or dislike it, the trading mechanic made it so that even if it wasn't your turn, you were still doing things and you were still paying attention to the game. Because, I mean, think about how often you're playing Risk and if it's not your turn and somebody's not attacking you, you're not doing anything. It's boring. You're not you're not engaging with the game at all. And so it kept people engaged and it kept people interested in the game. And, I mean, the expansions have done a lot, I think, to fix sort of some of sort of the, the issues that we've seen over time. But it was just cool to, as it just spread, I mean, that was a game that, that that and Carcassonne were the games that my family played growing up. And, you know, it was still a really fun game to, like you said, it's just a fun game to break out because it doesn't have to be super intense. Catan really walked so that a lot of really dope board games could run that came later. And so if Klaus, if, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Klaus Torber, uh, tremendous uh, mind, a tremendous uh, achievement in game design. Uh, I'm lifting up a, I'm lifting up a tasty beverage right now here, in my home, for Klaus. Absolutely, rest in peace. It is a legacy that's going to last. I mean, as long as board games are around, I think at this point, there's only so much we can say that other people are going to say better. But I just wanted to take a moment to to really sort of remember Klaus and the the legacy that he's left. Um, we are going to go ahead and move on to our main discussion. We're going to go ahead and talk about Isle of Cats, and we'll be right back in just a second. All righty, and welcome back to the Dice Pirates. And we're going to go ahead and dive into our main topic for this week, which is a review of a game of felines at sea, of cats on the high waves, it is Isle of Cats. Uh, it's cute. It's uh, oddly complex. Um, we're going to break it down for you guys and uh, see whether or not this game is... Uh, is it any good or not? Uh, Ian, why don't you get us started with a quick overview? How's this game work? Yeah, so we'll go ahead and jump into the... Like you said, a brief overview. Not going to go into the rules. That's... The game has that issue where I think there's a, a false sense of complexity to the game. It's not actually that complicated, but when you go through the rules, it can get a little bit... Uh, it can get interesting sometimes, because basically the the main, the main thrust of the game is that you're trying to save as many cats from this island as you can. And so each round, there's going to be a bunch of various cats that are available. And the cats are essentially tetronomos, uh, you know, much like games like Blockus. Uh, the cats are a series of squares that are connected. So you may have an L shape, or you may have one that's a square. You may have one that's just a long piece. And your ship is also is a uh, is a grid um, overlaid on top of your ship. And so as you put the cats down, you have to sort of. But getting the cats does take a second. So you're trying to get the cats, but. At the start of each round, you're actually going to go through a card drafting phase because the cards are going to go ahead and give you mm. baskets, which are used to then trap the cats. So you can get them onto your 
You can get them onto your ship. You also have lesson cards, which are going to be end game scoring. And you have cards that are going to make you go faster or cards that will give you extra um, fish, which are essentially the currency. So there are a lot of moving parts. You have to spend fish on the cards, but you also have to spend fish to go ahead and get your cats because each cat is going to require a certain amount of fish to essentially lure them. There's a lot of moving parts. Like I said, sounds super complicated. And it's like when you start explaining it, it, it too often you're like, oh, people st- I start glazing over because, oh, wait, so I have to purchase cards, but I have to save enough fish so that I can lure the cats, but I have to have baskets to do so. And then once I get the cats, I have to try to cover rooms and put families together. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's hard to fully explain the game. I'm sure if you've played the game or if you've heard about it, it's worth looking up pictures of it because at its core, it really is just trying to fit these cats onto your boat as smoothly as possible. And everything surrounding it, all of the stuff getting it falls into place pretty quickly. But the act of explaining it is truly it's, it's truly crazy. And I, I'm sure you guys have experienced that as well when you're reading through it. And you're like, what is what is happening in this game? Yeah, I will say that the first couple times I played Isle of Cats, I did not love it because uh, I really had no idea what was going on and there's i a credit to the design but something that i didn't fully understand at first was just how well everything ties into everything else Mm -hmm. like you really have to understand the tile laying portion of the game to figure out Mm -hmm. what's important in the card drafting part of the game like you can't just draft cards that look good and then you get to the part with the tile laying and you're like oh i actually can't do anything because these are all garbage cards now because i didn't prop you know you you have to to be very careful about the hand that you're actually building and how it ties into everything else i mean okay i'm not gonna lie to you guys i don't love this game in fact i may actively dislike this game (laughs) Okay. Uh, and I'm willing to concede that it is because I don't understand it and I'm very bad at it. <laughs> so it is. this is probably coming from a subjective place. But here's my core problem with Isle of Cats. It is two games in one, and only one of them is actually fun. Uh, on the one hand, you have the, the, the selling point of the game is this Tetris-like experience of trying to fit weird elongated cats onto the boat to fill up spaces you're getting bonus points for filling up uh rooms for filling up uh you know having certain cats of a certain color touching this you know all the edges or this or that i mean there's lots of little like scoring bonuses for how you arrange your cats and the visual puzzle of like putting the cats together trying to figure all that out is great it's tetris uh as i've said before on the podcast the name catris was right there uh, they, they, they could have built the whole game around it. But before you can get to the fun part where you're putting the cats on the boat, you have to go through this really tedious, truly tedious drafting phase that involves uh, a little bit too much like high-pressure thinking that I find inscrutable, and I can't think in my head. Because you're having to do several things simultaneously. You need to be thinking about the cats that you need to get onto your boat to do the things you're trying to do. You need to be thinking about uh, in-game scoring bonuses that you may possibly or maybe not want to acquire that you can have off to the side. You need to be thinking about uh, other little powers and cards that have neat effects that maybe you want to play. Those are, do I want to get that? Do I want to not get that? All the while, while you're weighing the pro and cons of every one of these cards that comes your way, you also got to be thinking about fish. Like, I need fish because it's like, I'm spending fish to buy these cards which, by the way, are associated with baskets. And I need to have a basket for every cat that I'm going to acquire. But it's like, I also need fish to buy the cats later. Did that make sense to you? It didn't hardly make sense to me, and I've played the game like four times. You need the same economy that you're using, fish, to buy the cards. You're also using to later buy the cats. So you can hose yourself by over-investing in cards and then not actually being able to buy enough cats. But if you underinvest in like baskets and stuff, you're not going to get enough cats. And then even then, it's like you got to be thinking about the cats you need to do the thing you want to do the thing. That... It's a lot. It's just a lot. It's it's layers upon layers of a game that doesn't, I feel like, need that amount of complexity. 
So this is actually where I want to talk about the family mode because the family mode uh, actually strips the entire front half of the game away. Um, when you play the family, well, good. when you play the family mode, uh, the card drafting is gone completely. The concept of fish also gone completely. Baskets are gone completely. Um, when you play the family mode, you are given uh, instead of going through the card drafting process like you're talking about with Matt, like Matt was talking about when you're pulling out baskets, when you're also having to pick out the lesson cards, which are your end game scoring. So you have to also make sure as you're going through the card drafting process that you Per, you purchase your end game scoring or you're not going to get points at the end in the family mode you're given a couple end game scoring cards and you can choose which ones you want and every person gets to do the same so you get to choose a couple end game scoring cards and then much like the normal game you go ahead and you put out the cats on the island and the cats are available and then you just take turns picking them and you put them on your boat and that's each turn you, you put the cats out you grab a cat put the cat on your boat everyone does that till the cats are gone move to the next turn Rinse and repeat. You do that for five turns. Game is over. When I first heard that, I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. And this is where I think I want to make an argument for... I'm not going to say it's a... I'm not going to say that it's necessarily a sign of good design. Maybe it's a sign of bad design. But I think the card <laughs> drafting is necessary to make the game enjoyable. Because when we played the family right. mode, my biggest issue was that it was just kind of boring. Like, mm -hmm. without the without the tension of having to figure out, okay, well, which cats do I want? Because I have a limited number of baskets, so I have to pick the correct cats. I have to pick the correct cards because I can't take all the cards. I have to decide what the best cards are. When you just are going through the process of, I can grab every cat so long as there's a cat left there, you remove all of that decision-making. It just comes, what cats are available? Let me just put ones together. The decision-making space is lowered to almost nothing. You each take. Right. You still want to put cats together. You still want to get lots of the same color cats together. You still want to cover up rats. All of the stuff you've done before, but it's just it's 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 all made so easy that there's no tension mm -hmm. to any of it. And because there's no because you don't build up to the cats, it just makes it a very each turn is very samey. And so we got to the end. Uh, we played we played through this a couple times, and I was just like, well, that was it. it just felt anticlimactic in, in, in a sort of way because you get to the end and it just didn't feel remotely satisfying in a way that the you other barely game did. played a game we barely played a game and that's not to say that that's not to say that it's like oh it's um, you know like my like aaron said everything sort of fits together and it's clear why they made the game the way they did now i do agree i think the game can be a little bit bloated in terms of its mechanics sometimes I think that there is an argument that because that's necessary, maybe the core game itself is a little lacking. But I do find that playing it without the card drafting mechanic actually makes it far less enjoyable as a game. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say um, I thought I understood the game and then Matt was giving his very poorly explained overview of the rules. And I was like, oh, oh, like I understood it better just based on that having played it several times it's like oh yeah. that's why i was doing so bad okay um yeah yeah i mean it's i will get i think part of the reason that it seems fiddly part of the reason that it seems over complicated is because it's over complicated is because it's about kitty cats honest to goodness yes if this was okay the game where you were pillaging treasure from an island and everyone was pirates and there was sure. you know, chests and piles of loot and stuff like that I think it would seem like an I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't sound kind of derogatory toward the game but it would seem appropriate for the game because you no, I get that completely expecting that level of complexity but because it's about uh, cute little kitty cats yeah it, you're like oh well why is this so i don't understand this part i think it attracts a i think it attracts a sort of audience that isn't necessarily i don't want to say prepared for but isn't expecting that sort of of mental commitment to you know that level yes. of overhead yeah. you know Okay, I got a great that you just made me think of is like a great counterpoint to this is like, the, and this is not a game that's in any way a parallel to this, but the game Anachrony, 
you you immediately hear the title anachrony which is like, a nonsense oh, word this is some like stuff right here yeah you're like okay right away you're in the zone of like this is i'm in the deep end right away and then you look <laughs> at the cover and it's like very serious like avant-garde like font and art design you look at the components and you're like an unnecessary intrusion of plastic into a Euro game. Oh yeah. I know what I'm in for. Like that game presents heavy and then delivers real heavy. Like it, it presents with a level of complexity that it even exceeds, but you're like, we're already going in expecting, Oh, this game's going to be a lot, but I'm there for it because I'm a person who would buy a game called Anachrony. Now you hear a game called Isle of Cats and you're thinking like, this is a cute little game about putting little cats together on a boat. It couldn't be sweeter. It couldn't be cuter. And then you get into it and you're like, why am I having to budget out my fish like I'm like I'm planning out my 401k, but the market's against me. Like it's brutal. It, I think the issue is not the drafting though. You make a great point, Ian. I think, because almost all these games that are like, uh, tableau, not so much tableau building, what you call it, like a mosaic building or like some kind of puzzle, like uh, Azul or Sagrada. A lot of those games, I, it, almost all the ones that I've played that I can think of, have some element of like a drafting mechanic. Because you're right, without it, where's the tension? You know, you've got to like, there's got to be a tension of like, oh man, I need the, the thing that I want. I need the colored dice that I want or the little tile that I need to do the thing. Where I think this game messes up for me and it's subjective, is the basket. Hmm. Okay, and I know we kind of glossed over the rules, but essentially, you have to, like, to acquire a cat to go onto the boat, which is the tile-laying part of the game, to even do the puzzle. You have to have baskets to put the cat in. And you have to buy baskets with fish. But you also have to buy cats with fish. So there's, like, a budgeting in the game that's inherently tense. Like, more tense, and it requires a little more math than, like, I was prepared for. And I know this is very... So some people that are like, this is not complicated at all. But it's complicated to me. I'm having to think through how many baskets do I need to buy at any given moment to be able to hold all the cats that I need to do the thing, to get the cats onto the boat, while at the same time reserving some amount of fish in any given round for, like you said, in-game bonus tiles or in-game bonus cards or powers or, like, whatever... The the basic just budgeting of fish is so granular <laughs> that it's like it drives me crazy. I I think the drafting would have been fine. Just going around and drafting cats or having some kind of mechanic of like getting the cats you want would have been tense enough. But like everything else they added onto it is like way overkill, in my humble opinion. That's I mean that's perfectly fair, honestly. And uh, I mean nothing nothing you said is wrong, a hundred percent. Um, except all of it, uh, all of it's wrong. Except for all of it, <laughs> except for the except for the bulk of it. Yeah, uh, I mean no, and that's that's to be I mean to be fair, you're you're a hundred percent right. It does present as less complicated than it is. It is I think a layer of complexity more than you'd expect it to be. However, I don't think it's necessarily. I, I think it's a lot of it is surface level complexity. Because, yeah. yeah, there is a little bit of math to it. You do have to plan ahead, and that is going to take some people by surprise. But I've, I found, I've, taught this, I've actually taught this to a lot of people because me and, me and my wife really love this game. This is our go-to game when we have about an hour. We want to play a game that's, you know, we're not, pulling out a, a, we're not pulling out something with tons of components. It's just the right amount of setup. It's a decent you know, puzzle that we have to think through, but we don't want something super light. So this is kind of our go-to. And we've taught it to quite a bunch of people now. And I found that after about the first round, it takes about the first round, because you start explaining explaining it to people, and they're like, okay, oh my gosh, okay, there's fish and the baskets, and wait, I, I thought we were talking about cats, you know, and it gets, the eyes glaze over. But after about the first round, you can see it clicking, and they're like, okay, okay, I get it. And there have been multiple times where we played with somebody new and they've either done well or a couple times they've won the very first time playing because there are things where you can say, look, just get baskets and then get as many of the same color cat as you can. And they're like, okay. And they end up winning off of that. It's not so complex that you can't give somebody one or two things to worry about and they will do okay. If you want to win consistently, obviously you have to learn it. Like you have to figure it out, and there is some com- there is some depth there. But it's not so overly complex that if you focus on a couple things, you will be able to do well, and you will be able to enjoy yourself. It is a bit complex, but I think it does actually deliver on the chill experience that it wants to. You just have to get a player two under your belt 
to not be intimidated yeah. by the mechanics because it does come on really strong. But it is a game, and I, you know, I, I mostly just want to say this because we have kind of been talking about the negatives of it. But like I said, we love playing this game. This is one of our most played games over the past few months. We pull it out all the time because it is, once you get the hang for it, it's not really that complicated. You draft cards, you decide what you want to pick, and then you go and you get your cats. It's not actually that complicated at the end of the day. It just requires yeah. a little bit more than you might expect from it. So I think if you're willing to give it a shot and you're willing to do a little bit more thinking than it might look like, it's absolutely worth picking up. I think it's a great game. I, you know, you're raising a great point. I mean, it's like, you know, my complaints of the game, like, are some people will play this and be like, what in the world? Like, it's super easy. It's totally intuitive. You know, it's like, it's very subjective. So don't don't get me wrong. I think this game is probably mildly polarizing for that reason. Uh, the first act of like acquiring your like cats and hand of cards for the round just is tense for me and a little bit inscrutable just because it requires a little bit of like forethought that I'm not super good at because it's like I need I need to plan for buying I need to buy cards I need to buy cats and I need to have the right cats to do the right thing that's like that's that's not I mean that's not trigonometry but it's like a little bit <laughs> <laughs> it's more complex than Sagrada, which I'm pretty absolutely. good at. Yeah, absolutely. It's no, much it's... more complex than Sagrada. Much more complex than Azul, which Azul has drafting is a little more involved, even than Sagrada's is. There's a little bit more going on in Azul. Um, so I don't know. I think on the spectrum, like it's actually probably a really good. This game's probably a really solid recommendation for somebody that wants a kind of like. What do you call this genre of like building a little map, tetronomo type experience? Yeah. Uh, but with a scooch more depth, like a little bit more, a little bit more complexity and some thematic flavor. You can't. You, we haven't really talked about it, but the this has like fantasy trappings that are kind of fun. Like the cats are not just like normal cats. Like they're weird, like druid cats and like elemental cats. And yeah, there's they, like a weird magical vibe. Oh, they put effort into the, the story behind this. And it's, uh, I, I wish I engaged with it more, but it's, it's a lot. Well, I think even if you don't like engage with the story, like visually, it's a, they put a lot of thought into the art design and the feel of it. It's Absolutely. a good game. It's got good components. It's nice to play around with. One thing that I do want to point out, actually, regarding the art design uh, that I that I think is really cool is um, uh, the people that designed the game wanted to make sure that it was inclusive, and so the cats are all different colored. It's it's very important that the cats are different colored. You have to you have to know uh, what color they are so you can score points. Um, but they actually thought, like, okay, well, what if you're colorblind? So the cats actually have uh, very unique looks to them as well, especially the tails. All Every tail is unique. And so each type of cat has a very specific looking tail. And so yeah. even if you're unable to see the colors properly, you can know what type of cat it is that you're picking up. And that allows you to do so. The colored meeples are all individually distinct in the way that they look. So each group will also, you know, which color it is based on the, the type. And I think that's really neat. That's They thought about that in a game that does rely on that color and mm. they put effort into that overall it's a game i it's a game i really enjoy and like like matt said you know this is this is 100 percent a recommendation if you're willing to put a little bit more effort into it definitely more complicated than something like calico or sagrada you know calico another another very chill cat game but much more you know much less thinky than this one but yeah absolutely a recommendation it does come on a little bit strong but i think if you're interested in you know a, a medium length medium weight game that is going to engage you i think this is a perfect pick All right, so that's our review of Isle of Cats, a game that, you know, a little controversial there, but one that uh, I definitely enjoy, something worth taking a look at. Of course, we do always appreciate you listening. It does mean a lot to us, and we would love to also contact, we would also love to hear from you. Matt, if people do want to reach out to us, where can they do so? Uh, Ian, they can find us on the internet, on the World Wide Web, specifically at Instagram. You can find us on Instagram at Dice Pirates. We are there all week long, posting updates and reviews about the games we're playing, fun stuff to the Instagram story. And guess what, folks? We'll respond to your messages. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you're playing. Let us know what you like about the show. And uh, we'll talk to you in real life. And even be nice. Do reach out if you get the chance. We always love to hear from you. Of course, we will be coming back soon with another episode, so keep your eyes peeled for that. But until then, we'll be right here on the Dice Pirates. Play more games!